It takes a third party to stop third party risk. How MSPs protect you from your partners and building out your vendor partner ecosystem. That and the latest news and trends in the managed security space coming right up on Cyber for Hire. Building bridges between managed security providers and their clients, it's the podcast where MSPs, VCSOs, and end users take a united stand against cybercrime. This is Cyber for Hire. Cyber for Hire, the managed security podcast, would like to thank the following initial launch sponsors for supporting our program. Aptiga, AT&T Cybersecurity, Cisco, Netsurian, and Stellar Cyber. Be sure to keep watching future episodes for more details on these sponsoring organizations. In the meantime, to learn more about our sponsors, you can visit us at msspalert.com slash sponsors for additional information. And of course, be sure to get your fill of timely news and analysis from our partnering digital brands, SC Media, MSSP Alert, and Channel e to e All right, welcome, welcome to episode number five of Cyber for Hire. How's everybody doing today? I'm Bradley Barth with SC Media in New York, and joining me as always on the other side of the continental divide is my co-host and partner in cybercrime, Ryan Morris, principal consultant with Morris Management Partners. Welcome, Ryan. How you doing today? I'm surviving. I had a coughing fit immediately when you started talking there, so I had to quickly mute myself. Hopefully, I covered the cough. You you did. I, I wouldn't have known at all, <laughs> uh, which is good. I'm, I'm glad you're already feeling uh, better. The cough has dried up because we have plenty to talk about, uh, lots to come, uh, but some news is so important that it just can't wait, right? Which is which is why we want to share with everyone what's top of mind today. So here's your headline. MSSP Alert reports that the multi-cloud MSP Rackspace uh, has confirmed attack on its hosted Microsoft Exchange service, uh, which disrupted email service to customers. Ryan, why is this top of mind for you today? So number one, that's a very well-known brand. None of us are, are surprised that they are the target of attacks, but I would argue that we would also assume, you know, anybody who's not presently working there at that organization, we would assume that given their value proposition and the basic business model that they operate, that cybersecurity that preserves availability and uptime would be their A number one technical functional requirement, right? That's something that we would take for granted. But obviously, that's not always a safe thing to, to assume because not only have they been the victim of a ransomware attack, but it has caused significant disruption to customers. And if you really want to understand why this one I think is so important, not only did it take down their service, but it has taken down their stock price, right? In fact, just the other day, we saw that their total market valuation went under $1 billion of, of market value for the first time in more than seven years. Now, again, what this says to me from a customer's point of view is, hey, it's probably not safe to assume that just because they, quote unquote, should have the most advanced and capable cybersecurity defense in the entire industry, that's not a safe thing to assume, and you still need layers of defense in this process. When I look at this from an MSSP's point of view, my answer is, Points of aggregation equal very prominent attack vectors, and there's probably not many out there that are more large-scale aggregation points than rack space. So um, that is something that if you have a client, if you are an MSSP and you have a client that is ho having hosted services via rack space, it is not appropriate, it is not sufficient for us to just subcontract our cybersecurity defenses to that hosting provider, additional layers of redundant cybersecurity that surround anything that is cloud or hosted is absolutely best practice. Yeah, Ryan, you make some excellent points there. And of course, we always talk about things like reputational damage, but sometimes the damage absolutely translates into financial damage, like a stock price dipping. I mean, we've seen instances too where uh, you see a, a merger and acquisition that gets uh, thwarted or uh, majorly affected uh, by there suddenly being a, a breach or an incident in the, in the middle of the uh, financial transaction. So there can absolutely be bottom line consequences. Now, 
we're, we also we want to talk a little bit about the incident response and the attempt to mitigate this particular attack. And that also has run into a little bit of trouble, uh, as I understand it, particularly the migration process that Rackspace tried to set up. Uh, for some of its affected customers. You want to weigh in on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess conceptually the plan to shift people from their hosted colo resources into an actual public cloud environment on some private machines, that's that's a very legitimate baseline strategy, but no strategy survives contact with the em- enemy, right? As the as the old saying goes, If you've not simulated that transformation process, if you've not actually tested it with real humans under the pressure of time, then you can't imagine the weird and silly things that are going to go wrong, right? Because most of the reports that we're hearing about that process, these are not rocket science problems that that are preventing the migration or making it more difficult than it should be. Sometimes it's just manual labor, moving volumes, moving user lists, et cetera. That's not hard work, but for a multi-billion dollar company um, to actually suffer that kind of a bloody nose in the process of trying to manage through an incident that they should have anticipated was coming. Uh, nobody wants to, you know, nobody wants to think, oh, geez, I'm about to get hacked. Expect the best, plan for the worst, and you're probably going to be okay. And planning for the worst means simulating and testing for the worst, even in the rudimentary things like do your individual technicians know how to copy and paste directories? Because that's going to happen in prime time with the entire world, not to mention Wall Street, watching very closely. All right, Ryan, so I think that looks like your hot take for today. So uh, let's find out if the audience agrees or disagrees. Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you tell our audience, Ryan, uh, how they can weigh in on this? Excellent reminder, right? Again, we want this to be a conversation, and as such, we want to hear back from our listeners. If you guys uh, have thoughts, questions, feedback, if you had personal experience getting caught in this ransomware attack or the downtime that rippled from it, Cyber for Hire at CyberRiskAlliance.com. That is our email address for the show. We would love to hear from you guys so that we can uh, maybe feature some of your feedback in future episodes and continue this conversation. So please let us know what's happening on your side. All right, great. Thanks, Ryan. More more uh, news later in the show. Uh, but first, it's time for our featured MSP InfoSec news and strategy topic, presenting our big idea in security. Now, it sounds ironic and maybe even a little bit paradoxical, but it might just take hiring a third party to help an organization assess and mitigate the risk posed by other third party partners. Uh, For organizations that cannot or prefer not to spearhead this particular task internally, there are benefits of having an MSSP evaluate third party partnerships that exist outside of the client's organizational boundaries. But what are some of the best practices when conducting outsourced risk assessment? And what are some of the latest trends in third party risk that MSSPs are observing? So to help answer some of these questions, I'd like to welcome in our featured guest today. He's Nick Ellsmore, SVP of Worldwide consulting and professional services at TrustWave. With over 20 years of industry experience, Nick leads TrustWave's global team, providing strategic advisory services to clients and oversees its penetration testing and incident response teams. Nick, welcome aboard today. Thanks, Bradley. Great to be here. So, Nick, as I was just mentioning, it can be trouble enough sometimes for an organization, even with a direct relationship to a third party partner, to get straight answers all the time on how much of a risk that third party might pose. So why now bring in another external organization to assess the risk of a a third party partner? There obviously are some advantages to doing that. From an MSSP perspective, what are some of the marketable benefits or advantages of taking this particular route or strategy? Yeah, so I think that the, the key thing to realize in, in cybersecurity is, I mean, the, this, the whole topic is an inch deep and a mile wide. Like, there, there's so many different things we're all trying to, to cover. And most people who get into cybersecurity are attracted by that. They're attracted by the variation that you get day to day, the fact that every day you turn up and you're dealing with a different problem. In a sense, third-party security and, and vendor risk assessment is almost the, the complete opposite of that which is, you know, you have organizations that have 
5,000, 10,000, 30,000 different vendors. And the assessment process for them is going to be near identical. Uh, And there are a pretty small number of people in the cybersecurity industry who are genuinely attracted to the prospect of turning the handle on 30,000 identical vendor risk assessments. And very few organizations that have the capacity to deal with that. And so it, it tends to be the type of service that actually lends itself really well to just investing in building the process, making it repeatable, building the workflows, building the automation, and then effectively handing it off to someone else to look after it for you. That's a great point, Nick. And and obviously, managed security service providers have lived this process on both the preventive side as well as being the victim side. Uh, we've lived through our own software vendors have being breached and causing cascading layers of, of vulnerability down through the industry. Um, we look at it, you know, inside our own operations as the tool sets and the manufacturers and other technology resources. When you're looking at end user organizations, 30,000 sounds overwhelming, but are there some logical categories? Are there some some streamlined kind of segments that you start looking at in order to begin that conversation around third-party risk? Absolutely. You, you can't just start with a list of 30,000 and say, let's, let's go and assess them all. You would, you know, you, you would spend your entire life doing nothing but assessing those vendors. The the first part, you, you really have to look at it as two phases. The first part is triage, which is there are 30,000 vendors within that list. You know, you've got some really, really big, significant uh, areas of risk. And then you've got probably down the other end, you know, organizations that really don't introduce any real risk. And so there are a handful of small questions that quite simply can streamline them into different groups. So, you know, what access to data do the organizations do the do the suppliers have? And it's both the types of data and also the volumes of data as well. An organization that has access to one uh, individual client record is a very different risk profile to an organization that has access to a million client records. Um, do they have physical access to the environment, to the office? You know, cleaners probably don't have access to your data logically, but they do have physical access to the CEO's office. So they need to be treated a little bit differently. Um, Do they have logical access to your environment? So do they actually have, you know, admin rights over your PCs, over your servers, over your data infrastructure? Um, Or again, do they they not need that type of access? You just send them an extract and they just look after it for you. Once you've got a few of those things cleared up, you can usually pretty quickly figure out who's, who's high risk, who's low risk and who you need to focus on first. That's an excellent point with the prioritization of which vendors to focus on first. And I would probably put that in the category of uh, an example of a best practice that you would want to apply as an MSSP working uh, with a client, uh, you know, with with a lot of different uh, third parties. Uh, What would be uh, on your list of other top uh, best practices that are uh, important to, to follow that you know the the client needs to know about too in terms of how this process works like just as one example and you might have several examples in your, in your mind but just in terms of you know, divvying up the shared responsibility of having visibility into this uh third party relationship uh who does what between the client and the MSSP so for me one of the one of the most important pieces is actually making sure that the the client themselves actually have a process in place to know who their suppliers are. Um, in in many cases, that's actually the bigger the bigger problem here. The the bigger problem is not actually identifying and assessing sort of the triage process and then the subsequent assessment to the thirty thousand vendors. The problem is actually that the thirty thousand vendors are actually made up of you know, vendors that have been signed up by six different companies that have been smashed together via mergers over the course of 15 years with different procurement systems that have changed, and people just don't have the data. And so even just understanding, you know, where is your sensitive data? And so when you look at a particular supplier and you say, you know, what is their risk exposure? What services do they provide? What information do they have access to? If you don't know the answer to those questions, 
then it's going to be really hard to to figure out how to start in assessing your your sort of risk exposure through third parties. That's the first piece. Beyond that, my my key sort of piece of advice is really just standardizing and automating the workflow and the process as much as possible. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, everyone would know from from things like penetration testing. You know, it, you can complete. Uh, 50 different penetration tests with 50 different providers and get 50 different reports. And if you try to consume that into some sort of centralized risk register to deal with it at an organizational level, it can be a real pain to deal with that. Through the same process, if you're trying to assess a huge number of vendors and each of them, you know, one of them you use a scoring platform, another one you send them a questionnaire, third one, they just send you their SOC 2 report and hope that that's okay. If you don't have a standardized way of actually doing that so that you can compare across vendors and across time, uh, it's just going to be an enormous time sink for the organization and things are going to fall through the cracks. You know, Nick, I really like the idea of standardized methods and standardized assessment criteria, right? I think that that's that, that's something. Maybe it's a holy grail for us in the service provider industry. Of you know, is there such a thing as a master scorecard that says you either are or are not a secure player and a trustworthy provider? I, I wager the folks in the cyber insurance industry might have a version or two of of that kind of a scorecard, right? Uh, but it it brings to mind the kind of there's a paradox of exposure versus preparedness, right? Like you, as you mentioned, some of my suppliers are going to be large and they're going to have deep access into systems and they're going to have, um, they're, they're going to have access to critical and or business processes, vital information. Others are going to be much smaller, much more, um, you know, periodic. They only just occasionally dip into the supply chain. But those small companies might actually be the ones with the lowest levels of cyber hygiene, right? They may only come in every now and then, and we may think, oh, they're small, they're infrequent, I really don't need to assess those guys. And yet, that might be the glaring hole in the defense. How, how do you reconcile that paradox of my frequency or, or, or size of exposure versus mm. the likely preparedness of the person on the other side? And I'll, I'll actually take that one step further as well, which is there's a level at which organizations are uh, small enough and the type of, da type of data they have access to or the volume of data they have access to is small enough that you may actually just fully accept that risk. And I'll give you, I'll give you a real world example. We do work with uh, insurance companies. Um, and for example, in life insurance uh, or TPD insurance, you'll have a situation where uh, someone will make a claim, um, they fell off a ladder, they, you know, hurt themselves at work, they can no longer, you know, they can no longer work, they can no, no longer do the things they love, and they're getting paid out on that insurance policy. It is not unheard of that some of those claims will be fraudulent. Um, and so effectively, you have private investigators who will be hired by the insurance company to go and ultimately see whether or not this person is actually walking around and ice skating and roller skating when they're claiming that they can no longer walk. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And so that, that uh, a private investigator, that person has hugely sensitive information. You know, they have all of the personal details, all of the medical records, all of the, the client information about that one person that they're investigating. But it's only one person. And so the question ultimately is from a risk perspective, from a risk appetite perspective, does the company expect this one private investigator to have a hugely complex cybersecurity program? Or are you actually just comfortable with the fact that you put a clause in the contract that says, please protect this one record, and that's enough? And in most cases, it's going to be the latter. And so the, the, the ultimate endpoint for what we're building with these assessments is not necessarily that we're trying to get every organization in the world to a bulletproof level of cybersecurity. That's not the game here. It's called a cyber, it's called a third party risk assessment because we're trying to assess the risk. And ultimately the risk is the likelihood and the consequence. You know, the consequence of losing one record is problematic for that one person. But from an organizational perspective, realistically, if, if you if you try to run a business on the basis that you can never lose a single client record, that is not going to be a viable business. Um, there has to be some cost 
you know, cost benefit assessment that's that's made. And so I think the key part for me is organizations need to recognize this is a risk management process. Uh, it's not about trying to lock every single uh, control down. You talk about the security scorecards and the questionnaires, which is obviously a, always a very key piece to the puzzle in terms of being able to assess the security of a third party vendor. Sometimes uh, the organization that has all these different third parties in an ideal world, they'd love to have uh, additional visibility uh, into the systems of their third party partners, uh, be able to go in there and perhaps uh, scan for vulnerabilities or exploits or have some degree mm -hmm. of, of, of access or visibility in there. But that can be very tricky, very thorny. A lot of third parties don't like it. Is that ever on the table in terms of you being an MSSP helping to negotiate that? Is that ever part of the game plan? Look, ultimately, all of this comes down to the relationship that exists between the client and the, and the supplier. You know, if, if the relationship is substantial enough is big enough and is relevant enough on both sides, then there's always going to be a willingness to have that discussion about how how that that assurance can best be provided. Uh, I guess an, another example that I see quite a bit is uh, we do work with uh, sort of SaaS software companies, and so software packages provided you know, online, not really standardized. Uh, and we and they will have those providers, those vendors will have clients sending in questionnaires and asking a SaaS software company to fill out 350 questions about their security profile in return for them buying a $29.99 a month software license. And ultimately the, the software companies are just saying, Look, we can't do this. Like this is non-viable. As soon as we fill out that questionnaire, the service is no longer financially viable for us. So, you know, here's the information we can provide. Please consume it. Please make the best decision that you can. Um, but we can't engage one-on-one -on -one with every single one of our hundred thousand customers to provide a different set of information. So I think uh, having those those sort of connections, having control validation, having um, technical access into supplier environments is possible, uh, but it's really only going to be limited to cases where there is a significant uh, relationship both ways. Uh, because uh, one of the other things I often refer to in this environment is, you know, the, the golden rule, the do unto others as you would have do unto yourself, which is almost all of us are both clients and suppliers. And so we also have to assume that if we're sending out 30,000 questionnaires, we're also going to get 30,000 questionnaires. And so there needs to be a, a, an awareness of the fact that the process we're trying to enforce, uh, if that was enforced on us, would we actually do it or would we think that it was ridiculous? That's a, that's a great point. Every client is a vendor in somebody else's supply network. So it's a, it's a very practical piece of reality. We have to do this, not just in concept, but in the real world, right? I think of maybe some of the cascading elements, right? So we've spent a lot of time in and around aerospace and automotive manufacturing industries, and it's rarely ever you know, they all have standards and practices that they implement and require on their on their third party suppliers right you must use certain software platforms you must apply certain accounting rules etc cetera, etc cetera. it's interesting to see cybersecurity rising to that level of one of the standards and practices but in most of those cases what we're seeing is that the auto oem will evaluate what's going on at tier one, and then they pass along the responsibility to that partner to do their own assessment of their own network of tier two, tier three suppliers. I think that might help make it a little bit more interesting, a little bit more viable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm wondering about from your perspective, you know, as I, as I kind of hear you go through this process, as an MSSP, my brain starts to tick to not just the findings of one set of assessments, but the data and the trending that can come from doing that across multiple end user organizations. Um, in, what's your experience in terms of being able to aggregate and anonymize that kind of data so that you could publish trends for vertical markets, like you said, you know, insurance or manufacturing, et cetera, right? Seems like there would be some patterns. How do we go about not just doing the service, 
but then capitalizing on the data that comes from the service. Absolutely. I think one of the uh, things you referenced a little bit earlier around uh, cyber insurance, I mean, ultimately, you know, that is where a lot of this data is being sort of centralized and aggregated, which is one of the things that the cybersecurity industry struggled with for so long is the quality of actuarial data to be able to really forecast accurately, you know, the cost of loss, the likelihood of loss and all those all those other bits and pieces. Um, the insurers are the other logical place for that information ultimately being. Um, one of the interesting aspects, I think, from the perspective of, you know, looking at the things like the sort of scoring platforms and some of those other, you know, some of those other systems that are in place is, again, they're all still largely uh, proprietary. They're all still largely based on, you know, different processes. There's a degree of competition there. Um, you know, the beauty of the cybersecurity industry is if you know, whatever standard you want, there's, you know, there's going to be a standard for that. If you don't like that standard, don't worry, there's almost certainly another standard. You know, we've, we've standardized on the plethora of standards that, that seems to exist and we create <laughs> new ones all the time. Um, it makes we, it we hard. We do love get, an acronym. <laughs> it, it, it gets really hard to, to make it comparative. Um, and then you've got, you know, different financial regulators in Australia versus Singapore versus the UK versus the US who all have slightly different requirements around what they expect as well. And so I think one of the real challenges that we have is even if uh, an organization's been assessed to uh, a standard, um, the reusability of that standardized assessment is still not particularly high because it's not actually being accepted by the stakeholders in the community. So there does need to be some, you know, some process for that, um, for that to ultimately come together. Nick, since Ryan asked you about the process of aggregating data points to uh, ascertain certain macro trends, uh, I feel like the natural follow-up question to that is, is there a particular trend that you've been observing that sticks out in your mind uh, in terms of uh, maybe either a, a, a newer or, or particularly salient uh, development in the third-party risk area and maybe what's generating uh, the, the most risk uh, lately or just, you know, what sticks out? What's top of mind for you? Yeah, so the interesting one for me is I mentioned before that organizations often don't know who their suppliers are. You know, or, or they they might know who their suppliers are, but they don't really have a depth of understanding about how those suppliers are used. And often that happens, for example, if the, the third party assessment process happens when a new supplier is signed up, but then they might have been signed up for one purpose and then subsequently engaged for a completely different purpose. And that may not be captured by the procurement team or any other team. But I think the most interesting piece for me at the moment is for a probably a few years now, a lot of the contracts we've been seeing clients uh, put in place have uh, breach notification obligations. So effectively, if, if the supplier has a data breach that impacts that customer's information, that they'll notify them within 24 hours, 72 hours, whatever the magic number is that was put into the client, put into the client contract. Those records, that data, from what we've seen so far, is, is largely unmanaged. Uh, and so the situation that we're seeing in a lot of organizations is a data breach is occurring. And then the question is being asked to the procurement team, to the legal team, to the business units, okay, who do we have to notify? And there are a lot of blank stares, um, which is, we know we have to notify a lot of people, but we're not exactly sure who we have to notify in 24 hours, who we have to notify in 72 hours, and who we don't have to notify at all but then maybe we should anyway. Uh, and so that that part of capturing that obligation around incident response process and breach notification is something that we're really seeing become a big issue for clients. Well, that's a, that's a great piece of advice because, I mean, I, I'm sure in the real world, we think, oh, breach, notification, that means I have to tell Big Brother in the government. 
I would think that your commercial relationships are probably significantly more urgent in that notification than some regulatory body that that might occasionally dip into into your sphere, right? I think that's a very very important thing. Uh, obviously, we we uh, can't solve this entire problem just in today's conversation, but uh, Nick Ellsmore, um, you are out there, and obviously people are going to be interested and they're going to want to follow up. And so, uh, you the the audience for you guys that have follow up questions, you can drop those to us here at Cyber for Hire at Cyber Risk. Alliance.com, and we will be happy to uh, pass those along to Nick and get some follow-up as well, because it's a very deep and interesting topic. Uh, before we let you go, Nick, uh, one more thing, though. right? What we observe in our business and through this podcast is birds of a feather, we, we tend to nerd out together on very unique things, right? Uh, so just to kind of test your bona fides and understand where you're coming from, what is it about your world that says we speak geek for Nick Ellsmore? And so the funny thing about that is you may have told from my accent that uh, I'm, I'm from Australia. I'm sitting in uh, in Sydney right now. It, I'd, I'd love to say that it's sunny and warm. It's warm, but it's not particularly sunny today. But uh, despite the fact that I'm Australian and I've always been in Australia, I've played baseball for about 30 years um, and followed baseball very closely for about 30 years. Um, and so my uh, my geek that I speak is very much around you know, baseball saber metrics. Uh, you know the the data platforms, fantasy baseball. I've got a legacy league that uh, you know I've been working on for uh, for a few years, and uh, I just I love the game. And uh, whenever I'm over there, I I go and see the games when I can. Um, you know, obviously have some of my favorite players, um, Mike Trout being uh, one of the great superstars of the game at the moment. I've got one of his uh, game used uh, baseball bats from uh from 2018 and you know for me i just i just find the game fascinating i think it's amazing that's fantastic and i will say the career and individual interest alignment between somebody who does risk assessment and and analysis and somebody who enjoys cyber metrics in baseball it's i all think data, you have right? You found your calling in life, sir. I think you know that. Do it. Do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. I. You might actually be the one who's doing that. Yeah. No. I. And, and in fact, Nick, it's fun. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I. I think we have an interest in common here. I've been a uh, a baseball fan for a very long time. Uh, a Mets fan, unfortunately. Uh, oh. Although you know, it's that it's been it's been rough. But I mean, like, I tend to geek out too with baseball because I'm one of those. Uh, guys who will go to a baseball game and I'll score the game, right? Which is a little bit of a nice. lost art sometimes. And I'll go there and I've got my own little system that I've done. One of my personal prized possessions is uh, I, I was at Felix Hernandez's perfect game uh, wow. with the uh, Seattle Mariners. And I have a scorecard that I kept uh, from that game. And I also have a, a scorecard from a, from a, a professional uh, official scorer who, who gave me one of his scorecards one time. Uh, so, uh, so that's, you know, to me, like that's where you can really, that in the Sabre metrics is, is where you can really nerd out on baseball if you want to. Awesome. Do you have yeah. a, uh, an Australian baseball player that's your favorite? I'm trying to think of the one I can think of is Graham Lloyd pitched for the, the Yankees back no, in so, like the, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've met I've met Graham a few times, but um, no. So at the moment, Liam Hendricks, the uh, closer for the White Sox, oh is, yeah, okay, uh, is a suitably uh, pumped up Australian. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, I tell you, it is. Uh, uh, every sport has reasons why we enjoy it, why we follow those things. Uh, I I tend to think that one of the things that attracts baseball fans, if you don't like data, you're probably not going to really appreciate what's going on because hit ball go far, catch ball, run fast. That's that's a f suitably entertaining sport, but it is all of the analytics inside and probabilities and the predictabilities and regression to the mean. I, I think that's why nerds love baseball. So excellent. Absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing, Nick. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Nick. I uh, really appreciate it. So that is uh, Nick Ellsmore from Trustwave. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, but that's not the end, so don't go anywhere. We're only halfway done. Please return for the second half of our episode featuring our uh, business and industry topic of the week, our InfoSec News Rundown, and our Dear Cyber for Hire advice column segment. 
See you in a moment on the other side.